can everybody hear me okay um, so um, those who are sitting in the last two or three rows they will hear the uh, talk going in the other hall as well so please come forward Well, of course, those who want to stay here and hear that talk, that's a different quiz. <laughs> yes. OK, so um, well, uh, do we have Hari here? So my first, uh, I remember my first presentation outside Pune was in Hyderabad. And that was the first time um, PG Conf India summits were held outside outside of Pune. Now that meetup has grown to that meetup has grown to like 40, 400 at audience, uh, 400 attendees, and I hope the same to happen with this conference or these two conferences combine, and then we hop across the cities in India just like what we are doing for PGU and um, PG, uh, PGCon Dev. Anyway, coming to the topic, um, this is almost the same talk that I had given in Bangalore for PGCon India, with slight changes uh, that, uh, I mean, some updates on what has happened between uh, the few months that have gone in between. Um, let's start with what data analysis is. Uh, I hope everybody knows by today, uh, analytics is hot, databases are hot. Um, but still, let's start from the definition. Data analysis is the process of inspecting, cleansing, transforming, and modeling data with the goal of discovering useful information, informing conclusions, and supporting decision making. Um, so the data analysis goes beyond what the databases are. There is a large part of the systems still outside databases. But the databases um, hold, um, hold a position right at the center of all the data analysis. Um, and that's where you know, PostgreSQL comes into picture. You know, PostgreSQL being an RDBMS, um, its role in data analysis comes into picture. So there are two aspects to data analysis, of course. There is one which is data, and then second is analysis. And let's start from the first part, which is data. What kind of data we are looking at? What kind of data needs to be analyzed? And if I would have given this talk 10 years back, 15 years back, then it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have, um, it's booming too much. Okay. It, it, it wouldn't have um, this complex diagram. You know, it, it would just have this part, part here and here. This all is the evolution that has happened in last decade or so. And that's what makes the analytical systems today very complicated. So from PostgreSQL's point of view, I classify the data in three categories. One, the data which is there in PostgreSQL systems in its own native format, which is heap. Then the data, uh, this is the solid line. Then the data in dash and dotted lines which PostgreSQL understands today. It, it is not represented in its native form, but it still is capable of understanding. And that's basically relational data, which is very close to the native data, but which sits outside, data, uh, which sits outside PostgreSQL. Um, then JSON, XML, those kinds of documents, logs coming from various systems, the data that is in systems like Hadoop, Cloud, all of that data. Um, even in Hadoop, I mean, Hadoop is a 
data store. So what, what I'm really pointing to here is the data in Hadoop which the PostgreSQL can access through the help of extensions. And then there is the third category, which is um, the data which is outside PostgreSQL, which it cannot understand right now, like images, audio streams, uh, videos, and so on. I I'm sure someday PostgreSQL will start understanding that data as well. But generally speaking, these three categories will continue to remain as the data also goes through evolution. The data which is in PostgreSQL, the data which PostgreSQL can understand, but which resides outside PostgreSQL, and data which PostgreSQL cannot understand. So let's start with at least the data which is in PostgreSQL. What role PostgreSQL um, uh, what role PostgreSQL can take for analyzing its own, it, the data that it has generated by its, its own, in its own systems. Um, so if we go back, uh, now, and we will also slowly come to the second part of data analytics, which is the analysis part of it. What do we need for analyzing data? You know, when we say that Data analysis is this, this, this of getting insights out of data, making decisions, gathering information from the data, and so on. What, what exactly, in concrete terms, it, it wants, and where the pos and how we position PostgreSQL for analysis. PostgreSQL has a number of features which allow it to become an analytical system make it capable of analyzing the data that is inside PostgreSQL in its native format. And that feature, that feature set is pretty rich, pretty large. Um, I have divided it into roughly four category, categories, but there are more. Um, so first, SQL constructs. In order to analyze data, we need some way to tell what kind of analysis needs to be run whether we want to aggregate the data, we, whether we want to join tables, whether we want to apply conditions, all of that happens through the SQL constructs. And PostgreSQL has uh, many constructs which are useful for analysis, not just for OLTP systems, but for analysis as well, which is like Windows functions, common table expression, join, full text search. It, I, I think uh, when I started as far as my memory goes back with PostgreSQL, full text search is part of PostgreSQL. So for that long, it has been um, supporting full text search. Then recently, we have, we have added capabilities like SQL JSON. I'm right now working on capabilities to um, have graph layout to the data which is in PostgreSQL. So the analytical capabilities are lot in PostgreSQL themselves are quite rich. That's the first advantage of using PostgreSQL. Second, um, as I said, the data types. The rich data types um, that are required for analysis. And I'll come to this point a bit more uh, in next few slides. Second category is the performance features. Um, when we say we want to analyze data, there is a huge difference between the characteristics of data in an OLTP system and analytical system. In analytical systems, the data is huge, not just in terms of, um, because there, are, there is historical data involved, and also there is a variety of data involved. And so the typical uh, features that OL system requires are not just enough. But PostgreSQL has features like JIT, parallel query, which uh, help querying faster, which where queries can crunch a large amount of data in uh, relatively small time. It has indexes, which allow these queries to run faster. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, materialized views, which allow caching the results that these queries produce. Um, so, 
this category of so the first category allows the data to be analyzed the second category allows it to be analyzed faster incidentally the first talk i gave in hyderabad was about materialized views and that was 10 years back so again historically postgresql has been developing these features which are now useful for analytics and yet they are i mean postgresql users do not look at them that way you know no, well none of these some of them do but not, not not all of them are seen in a view of analyt analytical systems now the third category is uh, migration the oltp systems have different characteristics olap systems have different characteristics and all said and done about h taps we still need the data to be migrated from oltp system to olap system and analyze it there for that uh, postgresql has built in features um, like replication and fdw which allow the data to be migrated from one system oltp system to olap system logical replication plays an important role because these systems oltp and olap have different architecture and so simply taking a dump of data um, or rather the physical layout of oltp data and putting it into olap does not help you need the logical replication to happen it, the data needs to be logically replicated rather than, than physically now last category is a interesting thing it is again something that is not viewed as analytical capability but first two categories introduce some delay there is some delay for when the data gets created or appears on the oltp system and goes to a lab system and if the anal analytical system requires the real time data to be analyzed um, that even that delay is not acceptable in which case fdws come handy fdws allow the one postgresql system to talk to other postgresql system and query the data uh, while it is in that system the real time data so basically these three categories together make postgresql an attractive solution for uh, uh, i mean to be used as an analytical system the heart of that analytical system but then why postgresql is not used like for example teradata is used or hadoop is used the reason lies in this configuration where typically the analytical workload or analytical data is far more larger 10 times 20 times 100 times larger than the oltp systems and so even with all those facilities there postgres equal um, falls short of analyzing the data as fast or maintaining the clusters that huge as required by analytical systems uh, any questions till now okay now what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through two evolutions simultaneously one the evolution of analytical systems and how postgres equal has been trying to cope up with it okay so we will we'll discuss three architectures of analytical systems um, and also we'll see you know where does postgres equal stand in those kinds of architectures so the the first analytical system um, that has been there for decades now is what we call as data warehouse where the data is um, generated in multiple data sources typically olctp systems through extract transform load or extract load transform the data goes into data warehouse which is 
um, I mean, as the name suggests, it's a huge database system. Then from there, um, either directly the applications, analytical applications are run, or it is further extracted, transformed, load into data marts, which are smaller um, versions of these data warehouse, maybe one per data, uh, one per data an analytical application. And um, so you will see that there is a lot of um, movement of data happening from this age to somewhere in the data house, from data house again outside into data marts. Now what differentiates data of a data warehouse from an OLTP system is usually these three capabilities. Columnar storage, which allows efficient storage for the analytical data. It also improves query performance because um, the data is stored as columns, striped by columns rather than rows. Then MPPs, which is massively parallel processing, there are more than one node uh, processing the data, um, just like Hadoop, for example. And then they have vectorized processing engine, which means um, at a time, there are more than one rows being analyzed, being processed, unlike the OLTP system, which typically have Volcano model, where one row goes to the entire execution engine, then the second, and so on. Well, this has made, I mean, a small version of this in the form of batch processing has made it into OLTP systems, but still, this is much, this is much at a larger scale than uh, what a batch processing would do. Uh, PostgreSQL natively the, didn't have these, they don't, in fact, it even today does not have these capabilities. It, it does not have columnar storage. It cannot, um, I mean, it does not have an MPC, MPP system native to PostgreSQL um, and not, also not vectorized processing. But there were systems or forks of PostgreSQL, or there are forks of PostgreSQL, which um, which had architecture similar to PostgreSQL. It talked the same protocol as PostgreSQL and allowed uh, and worked as analytical systems. For example, Greenplum, there is Netiza. PostgreSQL, I was part of the team. It was built for OLTP, but I know it was used for analytical, analytical workload as well. Um, it had its own forks. Um, and then there were extensions which could be dropped on top of PostgreSQL, stock PostgreSQL, and allowed it to may behave it as an uh, analytical system like Citus and Timescale. So even though PostgreSQL itself did not, um, uh, could not be used as an analytical system, its derivatives did. These data warehouses had their challenges. For example, we saw there were so many pipelines, so many migrations happening, right? That added delay. And that delay, uh, that added delay, because there were so many components here, it increased the failure rate. Because of increased failure rate, these pipelines became um, longer. And thus, um, data warehouses contain stale data. If, if one wanted to analyze the latest data, it couldn't be analyzed in a data warehouse. Now, these systems were precious. Their storage was precious. Their computing power was precious. And so they required the OLTP data cannot be dumped as it is into data warehouse. It had to go through conversion, and which meant that it impacted data quality. When a data analyst, um, when a data scientist looked at the data in warehouse, there was always a doubt whether this data represents faithfully the data that was created in the OLTP system. These um, data warehouses were typically SQL or relational databases, so they lacked um, the data variety. And also, as I said, they were precious. The, the access to them was guarded well. And um, 
it, it lacked experimental touch. The queries were tuned, they were analyzed, and you couldn't modify a query just by going there and modifying it. You had to make sure that it runs faster, there were indexes, and so on. So it lacked experimental touch, which is very important in today's days. Data scientists do want to look at the data, play with it, and then create the models that would work. And those models also need to be need to evolve. As a result, so one extreme was data warehouse. As it always happens, the evolution took it to the other extreme, where the data lakes did not impose any schema. Raw data can be dumped as it is into data lake. <coughs> Variety of data can be added. The data was typically in open data formats. Um, so nobody was constrained that I have to run this particular engine in order to access the data. As you might have seen in the Hadoop world, there are every year some new engine comes up. And a new data op open format comes up. And they start analyzing the data. That, that was allowed by the data lake architecture. What was used as storage was object store, which was cheap. It was highly scalable. So nobody worry, was worried about throwing their data into data lake. <coughs> um, and then now that the object store was separate from the compute, both of them can be scaled elastically. Um, multiple engines could be added to it, which, which mean that the data was democratized and decentralized. <laughs> Nobody, it was, I mean, of course it had, the data lake had zones, which mean that sensitive zone was only accessible to few, but that was based on the quality or properties of the data and not so much because of the system. So. Anybody who wanted data, and as long as they had the right permissions and um, they were the right people, it was accessible to them. And they could deploy their own engines. They could deploy their own tools to analyze that data. Of course, that means that going all the way other to the other spectrum had its own problems. Um, the data lacked ACID, the comforts that ACID brings to it. When one analyzed the data, you wouldn't know whether the data that is being analyzed is consistent or not, whether it's accurate or not. Most of the time, the, the SQL engine was missing. So they used um, query languages which, are, which were not as rich as SQL. Indexes, statistics, all of that metadata was lacking. We still required ETL when they wanted to use SQL capabilities, governance, auditing, all of that was missing. OK, uh, before going further to the last architecture, of course, there was nothing in the PostgreSQL world which um, catered to these kind of use cases because it was quite free. Like Everything was without standard, without uh, format, so PostgreSQL had hardly anything to, <coughs> any reason to play or have a solution to offer in this case, unless, um, you know, it worked as a data warehouse in that system. So. Any question? Okay. Um, so, now the these two extreme worlds are converging. And what we have today is data lake house. So there is data lake, which is still the same as the data lake architecture. But there is this middle layer, which provides metadata APIs, transaction management, governance, versioning, all the things that were lacking in the previous model. And you will see that PostgreSQL has come back in this as a repository of this metadata, as um, you know, a, as a central point where um, 
uh, as a central point which provides all of these APIs to the upper layers, which again, um, you know, they, they are still the same as, let's say, the data lake model. So from data lake, we have storage compute separation, cheap object store. The data is still democratized and decentralized because one doesn't have to go through this. They can directly access the data. <coughs> it's in the open data formats. Um, but from the data warehouse, we bring data, uh, transactional consistency and the data access APIs in the form of SQL APIs. Mm. Okay, um, now when I say this that, you know, PostgreSQL or generally the relational systems have made their way into this new system, that is not entirely true. I mean, if you look at Iceberg, Hudi, those uh, standards and format, this layer here is actually merged into the data lake where the metadata makes it itself into the um, open data formats. Yet, there are many limitations. For example, one cannot have asset properties beyond a table, things like that. So um, we still need something which is much richer for, rich, uh, for the applications that require that rich set. Now, what, what is forgotten when this architecture is created is this thing that is sitting here already is rich in SQL APIs. And so it does not need to remain constrained by this layer. It can very much spread across all the way up to here and in case of PostgreSQL even this way and downwards as well. Now, what helps PostgreSQL uniquely position itself in that category is its extensibility. PostgreSQL, as you know, is extensible. Um, you imagine something that should happen in PostgreSQL. You write an extension, and it happens. People have written hundreds and thousands of extensions to do anything with PostgreSQL, turn PostgreSQL into um, the heart of IoT, for example. Um, I mean, I, I had seen presentation where the person had used PostgreSQL as, um, as the heart of IoT system that he deployed in its home. So everything was controlled by PostgreSQL, even the lights, the latches, burglar alarms, anything you say was controlled through PostgreSQL. So that's the power that PostgreSQL gives in the form of hooks that can be exploited as extensions. So data variety, well, PG, say, PG vector is a good example of that. And people have been talking extensively with just for, about PG vector. Um, JSON, uh, well, JSON is now native data type. Um, it, which wasn't native at one point in time. Um, PostGIS, for example, is entirely an extension which adds hundreds of data types uh, into this category. Second, um, PostgreSQL allows to extend itself to different data sources in the form of foreign data wrappers. And now with table access method, you can store your data in Parquet format have an extension which can talk, uh, which implements the table access method, which can access Parquet format. And that, that data, which is in Parquet, becomes available, accessible in PostgreSQL. For horizontal scaling, MPP, we have partitioning plus FDW. Um, again, replication plays a role there um, to some extent by allowing multiple points uh, multiple servers or multiple connection points. Caching, we have talked about. And there was this 
data frames api which is nothing but um, data being processed in the languages which are easier for analytics we have i mean postgresql allows languages to be implemented so plr pl python are already there which can um, which can expose these data frame uh, apis as well on top of postgresql so at this point, PostgreSQL, it looks like, has come back and has quite many capabilities to become the analytical system of the age. And the way um, to do it, I mean, there are many ways, uh, and many people have tried it. But um, one example model is this, where PostgreSQL sits here. So it, it covers the entire two or three layers up to the application to the storage. You can deploy as many Postgres instances as possible, have the data, metadata replicated across them, which provides transaction management, governance, auditing, versioning, all the things. Then have FDW or table AMs, which can talk to the data directly in any data format. And of course, the PostgreSQL's native execution engine is still row by row. It's, it's still Volcano model. But we can plug an external query engine, which understands, column, which understands columnar format, works as a columnar query engine, and then have it plug into PostgreSQL. And then PostgreSQL, essentially, with all these components together, becomes an analytical system of age. Any questions till now? All of them, all of them use uh, mostly columnar formats, right? Like uh, ORC, Parquet, Avro being row format. But uh, right uh, in all of these scenarios. Um, unless Postgres has inbuilt capability to understand the columnar formats, it is pretty much not really useful, right? Um, so that is why probably you are putting in that new layer of columnar query engine pool or something. So with that in, in picture, do you think it will be really efficient to really pull in the data, put into the query engine pool, convert the parquet data into some understandable format that Postgres can really process? and then send it back. Because you have a layer which is actually converting, yes. whether it is during reads or writes. Right. So do you think that would be really efficient? Or yeah, I'll show a demo, okay. if the videos play well in, in the slides. But yeah, I have a demo which, uh, which shows that this can work. OK. Uh, and one more question now is? The, the, the advantage that PostgreSQL gives, of course, you know, one can just remove PostgreSQL from here and directly talk to po query engine. That nobody stops doing that. In fact, that's why data fusion was invented. The, pro the advantage of PostgreSQL is its rich API set, SQL API set. Anything which columnar query engine cannot handle, PostgreSQL takes the responsibility of that. So the, in that case, the query might run slow. But it, it will never happen that a query fails. It, it doesn't do what you want to do with it, along with all these things. You know, transaction management, auditing, versioning, governance, uh, all of that, like, which, which cannot be enforced by this query too. OK. And uh, also, when you spoke about materialized views, so whether we call those as result caching or the actual cache, um, Today, does it get automatically maintained when we modify the data? No, right? Not directly. Not, not in the native PostgreSQL. Yeah. But there are extensions, extensions which um, allow the materialized views to be incrementally modified. And hopefully, someday, we will get it in the community version as well. OK, so basically, Coming back to the question that you ask, 
Um, here is a model that Enterprise DB has developed, uh, an architecture, which is um, well slightly complex than, um, or, or, or slightly difficult to understand in terms of the data lake house architecture that we saw earlier, but it's essentially the same. There is PostgreSQL compute, compute instance which can be scaled. It has its own volume, which has basically the metadata and transaction management and all the metadata. Um, then this meta store, by the way, is different from the metadata that we talked. This is more like a control plane. And this is the um, columnar execution engine, which is a um, modified version of data fusion. So, and this is the lake, actual lake, the, the storage. And this is where, you know, the caching happens. The queries results are cached. And, um, well, the, this is experimental setup results in January. I, I didn't get the latest results, but we see that almost all the queries have performed better than uh, stock PostgreSQL. Oh, all the, this is, I think, TPCH. So that answers your question that, you know, putting this stack together, although it adds so many layers, it still performs better than net stock PostgreSQL. Um, do we have time? Five minutes left? Well, let's see um, if I have luck with the demos. So this is um, Enterprise DB's big animal, um, well, which is not big animal anymore, right? PGAI. Oh, PGAI platform. But I think the demo was created slightly earlier than the rebranding happened. Um, so this is where you create an instance. As it is expected, the instance needs to be created first. Um, I mean, we don't have like months to deploy an analytical system. So this demo runs for two minutes. So at the end of two minutes, we have a cluster which can be used for analytics. Okay, so you see that um, there was a previous cluster and now we have a new cluster. Unfortunately, the video is not as clear. Uh, And once the cluster is there, now it's green. Earlier it was blue, so it's ready. We can pick up the connection string, uh, connect it through any application. In this case, we are connecting through PSQL. But um, I mean, anywhere that connection string can be used, it is. Use, there are many, uh, well, it's not visible again here, sorry for that, but there are many benchmark data um, available with so many tables. Th when you create a cluster uh, for you to play and try it, and as you will see that, uh, is that better? Okay. So a simple query, count star, which is usually what data scientists do first time uh, from the billion row benchmark, um, it returns your results within sub-seconds um, for so many rows, which is not possible with stock PostgreSQL.
And the last slide, we talked about data migration. So once you have the cluster, you can add migrations for the data sources of your choice. Right now, other PostgreSQL systems, but that will be expanded later. So we, you define one sync. Provided the source, cluster, and the database within that source. And then choose a location where you want to put that data. Select the columns, the tables that you want to migrate. And yes, now this new cluster, the, the new migration, not cluster, migration is now in progress. Um, at some point, it will finish. The video is uh, two minutes, three minutes, so we, we won't wait for that long. But so within three minutes, that data has been migrated to the analytical cluster. Of course, the data is not migrated through PostgreSQL. Um, as we discussed earlier, because this first time uh, migration, or, uh, migration or ingestion, it is directly put into Parquet format. And after that, the logical replication is used to keep it in sync. OK, that's the uh, end of my presentation. Uh, we can take any questions if time permits. So uh, while we are performing this migration, right? While we are performing this migration, so like when we are selecting particular tables or particular uh, schemas from the Postgres, so do we have some um, ability to choose like this much data is struck means like in case of struck scenarios, will that auto sync or auto recover? or how this will behave? Like in case of failures, how it handles automatically the conflict resolutions? Um, so handle conflict resolutions or handle failures? Like failures. So handling failure, um, what happens behind is DBZM and Kafka are used to transfer the, uh, transfer the changes. And that pipeline takes care of the failures. Conflicts, right now, um, I don't think this works in multi-master scenario. But when it will start working as multi-master scenario, it will be part of BDR, or PGD, what we call as PGD, which has inbuilt conflict detection mechanism in it. And that, that would uh, take care of the conflicts. And, and one more to add on, like while while this is a continuous process, depending upon a requirement, there should be some uh, quality checks for this process to ensure the reliability of this process. process. Yeah, whether uh, means like data values check or row counts check on a daily basis, and that checks needs to be done on incremental numbers, like at what times this. Uh, data pipelines or ingestion, this triggers, or whether this triggers in a periodic basis. And for each run, how much, like whether this uh, counts are checked incrementally, or how this happens under the hood? Um, well, I'm not aware of such checks happening right now, but I will get, I mean, I'll inquire within the company and get back to you. Um, I'm not sure what, like, this is this wasn't there in February, okay, and it is now it's in second GA. So things are changing past. So I need to go back and check uh, what's the current state. Yeah, thank you. Thank. You. Do you want to add anything? One very important thing which is happening right now in ADB is we are working on a layer which is which we are calling it as lake house sync 
which is effectively today you can use a Debezium for all your data sources to bring all the data to this lake house. Uh, once the lake house sync is G8, okay, I think it would be a platform all in a whole, all in all in one. So it would it would cover different. Today it is as Ashutosh just mentioned that it, today is, it's just for Postgres. Uh, Oracle is any which way you can migrate it. Even down the line, RDS data. So imagine a layer uh, where you have Postgres, you have RDS, you have Oracle, and you have other databases. And Im imagine a lake house sync layer just on top of it. And then you have the spectrum of uh, entire stack for, for converting all these hash tables to open tables and taking the data further to the users or to the downstream or upstream applications, depending where you are. I think just wait for a few months. We should be good to go. So by 2025, it will be a good, robust go-to platform for AI. And, and I'm sure a lot of things is going to come up. Now, I, 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 I just say that you know I'm from development background. He's from sales background.